Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. Welcome to Bread and Roses. In this week's program, we'll be speaking about Donald Trump's victory, whether it's actually a revolt against the establishment or it's actually the result of the lack of revolt and rebellion in the world that we live in today. I'll be speaking with Faribor's Puya on this victory and what it means for people across the world. We'll also be speaking about flogging in Iran for celebrating a birthday party and the status of religious minorities in countries under Islamic rule. And we'll talk about how that discrimination against minority religions is also permeating into the life in Britain and the role that Islamic organizations like the Islamic Research and Education Academy play in perpetrating that. The insane fatwa this week is from ISIS and a change in their rules regarding the numbers of times one must pray. The slice of life is from India and the battle of Muslim women against the discriminatory triple talaq rules. Don't go away, you don't want to miss this program. This week, a young woman in Iran was flogged 80 times for celebrating a birthday party. And she has on social media come out and said, she's unnamed, but she's come out and said that it was the worst moment of her life. Her hands and her feet were shackled and she was flogged 80 times in prison. It's tantamount to being tortured for merely celebrating a birthday party. Now again, there are many such stories we know that the flogging of Raif Badawi is going to be started again. His wife, Ensof Haydar, has issued a statement saying that there are reports that his next set of 50 lashes is going to be implemented. Now we know that he was flogged 50 times initially and it was stopped after public outrage. He has been sentenced to a thousand lashes, which is tantamount to an execution order. And uh, now there are reports that he is going to be flogged in prison. Again, this is an outrage. Raif Badawi is being flogged. He's being held in prison for 10 years uh, sentence merely for raising the issue of religion and politics. And of course, we know that there's a case of as someone in Mauritania who is facing the death penalty for apostasy for questioning slavery and for criticizing slavery uh, in Islam. And of course, he is Muhammad Sheikh Mohatter, and the Supreme Court is looking at his case now. And again, we know that public pressure works. It's important to keep putting pressure. It saves lives. It does help to end flogging sentences and to free people from prison and it, it helps to remind the world and theocrats in particular that their right to freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom to be free from religion and freedom of expression are key and basic rights that belong to everybody. Now of course we know that this is the situation all across the board, including for people who are religious, religious minorities in places like Iran under Islamic rule face really harsh punishments, violence very often. The Baha'is in Iran are discriminated against. And of course, I don't know if you've read reports of Daesh collecting taxes uh, from religious minorities and how they set fire to the house of a Christian family, uh, killing uh, the 12 year old daughter. And this is something we're seeing not just in countries under Islamic rule, but this sort of discrimination and violence against religious minorities that's perpetrated by the Islamists is becoming normalized to a large extent. And we're seeing it happen more and more here in Britain as well. You've got the case of Assad Shah, the Ahmadiyya who was killed in Glasgow. It's clearly a hate crime. And of course, you've got the case of Nisar Hossein in Bradford, who was brutally and violently beaten and he has faced immense persecution for being a Christian convert and he's now had to leave 
Bradford because of the persecution he faced. And of course, this sort of persecution and discrimination has been normalized by Islamist groups like the Islamic Education and Research Academy that promotes the death penalty for apostates and ex-Muslims and for LGBTQ plus people and also, for example, stoning of women to death. Now, the Charities Commission has spent a few years investigating the IERA. They've also looked at a report by the Council of Ex-Muslims on this group. This group is something that we've called a hate group that's inciting hatred and violence against those that it doesn't like. And whilst the Charity Commission has found that it is promoting extremist views, nonetheless it hasn't revoked its charitable status and that's a minimum that has to be done. Groups like the IERA are promoting Islamist norms. They're not religious groups, they're not pious groups, you know, providing religious education. Uh, they are hate groups and they need to be recognized as such. In this week's program, I interview Fari Bors Puya, my former co-host and a political analyst and commentator, about the Trump victory in the US elections. And I ask him the question of whether this was really a rebellion, a revolt against the status quo, or just really more of the same because no real rebellion and resistance exists. Stay with us and hear what Firebars Puya has to say about this Trump victory and its consequences for the world today. Hi Firebars, it's wonderful to have you in the program again. We've missed you. I'm pleased to be back as well. I miss the uh, uh, program, Bread and Roses. It's wonderful, but you're doing great. Waiting for you to come back. Okay. I wanted to ask you about Donald Trump's election. He's the next president of the United States. People are shocked. Were you shocked as well? I was shocked because I was displeased with the outcome of the election. And I think a lot of people were shocked. They couldn't believe it because, uh, you know, people were not happy about the choice and the outcome of the um, election in presidential election in America. And that's why people are shocked. He's not shocked that. And after the, they think, you know, a person who stands up and lies in your face, a person actually misogynist and he's proven that to be a person who lies and who pretends to defend you know uh, the working class or the Don Traden or people who actually you know uh, have nothing uh, hope, hope for the future suddenly he's going to, he's coming to um, to rescue everybody and be the savior and the messiah and people are you know seeing through him and that they're shocked that uh, the election could result in in such a person and that, that I mean that's why people are shocked but a lot of people did vote for him. So obviously there's uh, something that he's been able to touch on. Yeah, a lot of people voted voted for him. Majority of people voted for Clinton. Can I just say, make that point? Uh, she has the popular vote. But the issue is not, um, is a fact. There are several factors. Uh, if you compare to the previous elections, just a marginal people changed and switched. A lot of these people actually voted for, uh, th those marginal groups voted for uh, Obama and they switched to um, um, to Trump. And that, the, the, the reasons for that, and I think because they've given up hope on the uh, continuity of the current administration to resolve the desperate situation that some people are in. You know, Trump puts his fingers on the real grievances that a lot of people have against this system. Yeah, I think I think he does, but he turns it into the the nastiest version of those grievances. For example, if people are unemployed, he turns it against the immigrants. If uh, uh, people are not feeling well, he turns it against Obamacare. You know, where they, they, they Obama has tried to bring something else, you know, it's, it's not great. It has actually helped a lot of people. The premiums are going up, but he turns it against the whole thing. So he actually turns and twists uh, people's desires and needs into something else effectively. So he's, um, so he is dangerous in a way because he doesn't respond to the real. He taps into it, but turns it into something else. But genuinely, there are um, concerns, and this is not just in America. In Europe, I think you can see people are waiting for something happen to to happen. It's twenty first century, and there's been so much resources available, so much progress is made in terms of ability of uh, um, you know human beings to produce um, and look after 
the population, but could see that everybody's worried, you know, that insecurity increases every day. So people are looking for alternative. A margin of those people thought that Trump could come and change that. Of course, they're mistaken. There is an irony, isn't it, uh, that a billionaire is going to help the working people? Alfina, and that's that's the uh, as this is the irony. However, this is a part and parcel of a narrative which has been wrought, designed, and the right wing have turned that into an art, a complete art. You could see they've learned it from the Islamist, because they speak from the language of the downtrodden, uh, the fallen. The working class, the poor, you know, the inner city residents, you know, they, they tap into that. Nigel Farage says, I'm speaking for the little people. This was election of the little people. He, he does say that. They've actually turned it into an art and that needs to be challenged. They don't speak. The billionaires, the millionaires, the professional politicians, the city sort of trained and the, you know, the high top echelon of the elite, they don't speak for the working class. And they, that's what they do. But they've turned it into an art and that, that sort of narrative needs to be taken out of their hands and that needs to be challenged. The lie. They all lie though, don't they? They do actually. Clinton lies as well. Of course they do. And I think that's the, the gradual lie to openly, you know, lying. You know, one of the characteristics of, and I could say, I could say that they've learned it from the Islamists, to openly lie. And suddenly it's okay to lie. You know, Brexit says one day that you're going to have £346 million pound a week um, poured into NHS if you leave the uh, European Union. They suddenly, within 24 hours of the election, they say no. That's not the case. Trump says he's going to remove the Obama uh, build a wall between America and Mexico. Suddenly, well, he wants to keep the Obama care. Or we must to change it, but the fence uh, it might put a little fence between the thing. But I mean, that's the thing that uh, the lie constantly, and they've they've turned it into an. It's not an art. It's sort of a feature of the new right wing politics. As Islamists done that. The right wing in uh, Europe and America are doing it, and you could see that in in Turkey, in Egypt. You'll see that the right wing that becomes a f feature of the. Uh, but I think openly lying, and I, I think that corrupts the society. That needs to be challenged because telling the truth, I think, is important. And the need, people need to be held accountable for what they say, particularly the politicians. I know they all lie, but they need to be held accountable. And that's why the alternative to this, need one of the characteristics of the alternative to this situation, from right and, you know, the, the liars, need to be the protecting society and the higher stand of truth and election, if election of accountability, it's important. Keenan Malik says that uh, this uh, vote election was not about, um, you know, uh, was not a revolt against the establishment. It represented an absence of any real revolt. Would you agree? Absence of any real revolt. I think there's an absence of um, alternative. A vacuum has been created. You have, on the one hand, um, um, traditional establishment, the sort of or, or the social democratic or the left that merge into the poor Islamist sort of movement and people don't trust them. Um, and, and I think that's important. That sort of that's marginal that's been marginalized. I've taken away part of the, the traditional left with them. On the right or on the other hand you'll see that the establishment sort of gradually grinding people to the ground and the, the benefits are not there. So people are looking for alternative. So And that real, historically we've had the radical progressive movements who've actually created an environment to uh, advance, take society forward as to benefit with, people would benefit from this. That doesn't exist or if it exists is not a mainstream element that people could rely on for uh, for the improvement in their lives. And that vacuum has created a situation. So if he's referring to lack of reward, he most probably he's referring to lack of real alternative for people to rely on. And I think that that's true. That's a major element here. And that's in future belongs to this alternative. A lot of people will blame the left, the left that sided with the Islamists, that defended censorship, that have stopped any sort of real criticism of the situation at hand, particularly when it comes to Islam and Islamism. How can they be the solution? I think I I I, dis, I disagree. 
that this group of people that you've just described as left, they are the solution. They are remnants of the pro-Islamist movement or the or the Islamist movement. They are part and part. They've been absorbed and devoured by the um, by the Islamist movement. They are part of the old nationalist anti-colonial movement they have no solution the solution is very limited and you know they they, they can't provide they've, they've lost credibility we can't rely on this uh, faction of you know political faction to be the savior and and have a real alternative on the other hand you have the right wing will see the result of trump that's going to very quickly turn or the establishment they can't they're grinding to people to the uh, ground they Gig society, the Amazons, the Uber, the you know lowest of the standards, uh, outsourcing of everything to the lowest minimum wage possible. That's the um, that's the other alternative. So that sort of that left doesn't have a solution because solution is very closely linked to the Islamist movement. They have no credi credibility, and rightly so, they shouldn't have any cred credibility. A new left that which is universal, that wants equality between men and women doesn't compromise on, on these issues it wants children to grow in um, a safe environment which um, takes away you know religious interference in their growth they want critical thinking they want uh, uh, that everybody benefits from um, the the wealth that exists in society and is it wants a universal standards whether for people in Europe, America, Middle East, and that's equality. Then that, that's new force needs to represent itself as a radical progressive movement, and that's movement. It's absent as a reliable force to challenge both the pro-Islamist left and the right wing and establishment, and that's what is needed. Should people feel pessimistic? Not at all. Look at America. Everybody's in up in arms against election of uh, Trump and is a wake up, wake up call. Uh, the world is there for you to win. You know, there's opportunity. You'll have the break and down, br broken down, uh, discredited pro-Islamist left on the other hand and the uh, establishment which is actually driving people to the to the ground. And this opportunity for a universalist um, that to come forward and organize. It's time to organize, not to moan. Thank you very much, Faribos. Thank you. We look forward to having you back on the program very soon. Very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs> very soon, yes. Thank you. ISIS has issued a new fatwa on the numbers of times people are allowed to pray. The new fatwa in Iraq says that people can pray only three times a day. If they pray more than three times a day, they will be flogged. However, this same group issued a fatwa previously saying that people had to pray five times a day. And if they prayed less than five times a day, they would be flogged. So they're flogged if they pray five times a day now, even though previously they were flogged if they didn't pay five times a day. It's confusing. It is really confusing. They make it up as they go along. The point is not the prayers. The point is how can they get to flog as many people as possible? Keep changing the rules. No one knows what the rules are. You can flog more people. That's in a nutshell, what the Islamists are. I'm sorry, it's just not funny. The slice of life this week is the brilliant fight in India against the triple talaq rule, which is this rule that allows Muslim men to divorce their wives without them even being present via text or a letter, um, just saying, I divorced you, I divorced you, I divorced you three times, and then being able to divorce their wives. And there's this huge movement going on in India where hundreds of thousands of people have supported it, gotten involved, 
including uh, women going to the Supreme Court in India to challenge this rule. Of course, a lot of the women are facing great amount of pressure. They're being called un-Islamic, anti-Islamic, even though they're Muslims themselves, and they are standing steadfast. This is a movement that needs to be supported, that has to be defended. It is a movement for one law for all, equality for men and women, irrespective of religion and beliefs. I hope you've enjoyed this week's program and I look forward to seeing you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, have a wonderful week. Goodbye. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss table breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for vloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.